How are you, Miss Makami? Very well, thanks. How are you? I'm fine. I'm glad to thank you for this opportunity. You have given everyone of success. Uh, getting straight to business, who is Zodo Makala? Business or my personal life? Do you want me to? T okay. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you briefly about me. Yeah. Maybe starting from Zodo as a child, born in a place called Bemes in uh, Bulawayo, which is 40 kilometers from Bulawayo along Arari Bulawayo Road. They call us the famous. We're a minority in the country, but very prominent and beautiful <laughs> girls oh, wow. in the society of Zimbabwe. I was born there in 1972 um, by a lady called Margaret Mshlana. I've got siblings, there are six of us in the family. I've been the eldest, well, second daughter. My eldest sister passed on. I've got uh, three brothers and one girl. I mean, I went to school, primary school, at a place called Nkwashin. I'm sure you can't pronounce that. Yeah. Nkwashin is there, in the, in the Bundu there. We used to walk almost 10 to 15 kilometers every morning to go to school and mm. come back. So you are seeing a refined product, but that is where we started from. I went there from grade 1 to grade 6, and then to grade 7, then I moved to Harare, I went to Mount Pleasant from 1 to form 3, then I moved back to Blawayo to St. Columbus, I did my form form 4, then I came back to Harare again, I did my um, diploma courses and all that in, in Harare, and then that's a brief, a brief. brief round of who's all is. So how was the status of your family with the rich, poor, average? Well, I wouldn't call them poor. And also, I wouldn't call them rich. My mom was married to... Um, I was brought up by my uncle and my aunt. When my mom gave birth to me, she married one guy in Bembes there who maybe just wanted him, who wanted her as a woman, not her in the baggage. In the baggage. So I was brought up with my, my, my mom's um, grandmother brought me up. That's where I was staying. And then uh, my mom's uncle then adopted me at the age of uh, 14. He was well to do. He worked for Minister of Foreign Affairs. He was um, then an ambassador. He fought in the liberation struggle of Zimbabwe. So through him, I wouldn't say I came from a poor background because he, we had it all. I went to an A school. I had everything that I needed at school. So I never liked anything. Growing up, so I, I can say I came from a very comfortable background, considering the parents that then adopted me. But should I have stayed in the village, maybe I wouldn't be the person that I am today. Because most of my siblings, those that didn't have an opportunity to go out, they stayed there. But uh, fortunately, through me, I was able to take some of them out of the country to get them educated there and all that. So because of me, I've become the breadwinner in the family and I was able to remove my siblings from the village and bring them to, 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 to greener pastures, like we call it. So was there at any point you imagined yourself to be where you are today? I've never really imagined myself, but also what I did was growing up because, you know, when you grow up in a family and you not born in that family and there are some people that think they deserve to be looked after by those people better than you and they don't believe that you can do better than their own children. Mm -hmm. So I grew up a person who always had something to prove to the next person that, okay, fine, you might have the surname. I might not have the surname, but I can do better than you. Even if this is your own dad, I can do better than them. And I've proved it. I've done better than almost everybody that whether that was in my um, age group growing up. And I, I'm not one person who wants to fail in anything that I do. I've always wanted to succeed in whatever I touch. It always tends to gold. Even now, whatever I do, I don't want to fail. My children, the same thing. I've taught them that, look, failure is not an option. Yes, people can fail, but it's not an option. You can fail, but you pick yourself up and, and move forward. Wow. Okay. So in your crop, your colleagues, classmates, edgemates, how many are like you? Well, most of my colleagues are not in, in the country. Most of the people I went to school with are not in the country. I've not 
meet one or two that I've met. Most of them are outside Zimbabwe, so I don't know how they're different okay. out there. Most people left Zimbabwe, so I wouldn't really say I know much, but the few that I know about, they're doing well. They're doing well? Yeah. So, what were your favorite subjects at uh, primary, secondary, high school? What were your favorite subjects? Primary, funny enough, I liked maths, but secondary, I didn't like maths at all. I didn't even, I got a U for my A level, for my <laughs> O level mathematics. But I loved commerce, I loved business, I loved accounts, hence the business woman that I am today. Wow. So I think maybe because of that subject that I loved, that's why I ended up, you know, doing them at um, a higher level. Okay. So is there any specific time in your childhood, probably in high school, where you found a role model or where you got the purpose that you have today? Is there a specific time? Growing up at school, mm -hmm. like the family background where I come from, everybody was taught that when you finish all levels, you have to go to the teaching school. You have to be a teacher. So I was supposed also to be either a teacher or a nurse, but everybody mm -hmm. in our family was either a teacher or a nurse, but I was the only one that then said, you know what, I don't want to be a teacher, I also don't want to be a nurse which is why I then came to Harare and I looked for a course that was not offered in Blawayo because after I finished my O-levels, I moved back. But I came here, then there was a guy called Nelson Samkange, he's late now, may his soul rest in peace. Yeah. He, was the, um, he was working for ZTA. He's the one who then guided me. My father sent me to him to guide me for career guidance. Then he pointed the course that I then ended up doing to do with travel agency. That's how I ended up um, falling in love with my job, started up as a ticket salesperson for Express Motors then. I'm sure you guys were not born yet, you don't even know Express Motors, but some of us, those that were born, that were growing up during my time, mm -hmm. there was Express Motors, it was a luxury coach. It was there by Rizende there. That's where it used to be. And we used to have our offices there. We used to wear black uniforms. We loved our jobs. We were actually ticket conductors, which yes. is from ticket conductors, is actually an elevation. I'm now a, an, airplane, an aeroplane conductor. Wow. So, you're coming from being a ticket conductor? For the bus. For the bus? Yes. Working for someone? Yes. Who pointed you to the, like, the destiny that you now you are into? Who pointed you? Is there a, any role model or any Nelson mentor? Nelson Samkang is the one because the courses that I did was for yeah. international travel, international air travel and association. So when I was at Express Motorways, I was still going to college doing the course. When I then finished the course, then I worked for a company called, um, well, I can't mention the name because like, they're my competitor now. From one, tra one travel agent that I went to work for, then I started as a receptionist there and then to a junior consultant selling tickets until I was a senior consultant. Then I moved to another second travel agent until I got to a stage where I thought that I was tired working for other people because I was marketing and bringing business and I thought I could do it on my own. And one guy who then said to me, look, come, let's... Uh, I was actually teaching at Spaces College, the same course. So the, one of the guys that I was teaching at Spaces College then said, oh, it looks like you're good at this. They owned a freight company then. They said, okay, fine. Since we've got a freight company, mm -hmm. a travel agent might complement what we're doing. Why don't we start a travel agency together? Then I started a travel agency with them. We were four of us at uh, that business. That was in 1999. We started that travel agency together, 1999 up to 2002. And I still felt that I was not doing enough. Okay, I was not being paid enough for the work that I was doing. Hence, me moving away and starting Traverse Travel. And I said, look, I've got the capacity, I've got the clientele base. The clients love me. My customers love me. Why not branch on my own and start my own business? Then Traverse Travel was born, 2003. 2003. Yeah. How many workers did you start with? I started with the two. Two workers. Yeah, one is still there. How many workers do you have now? We are 20, 22. Uh, oh, I think there's more with the call center. There's impacting how many countries? We in South Africa. No, not South Africa, Zambia. Wow. So, you're starting with two. The 22 is not in, is it in, in Zambia, no? Okay. It's outside Zambia. And you pay all these people. I don't pay them, the company pays them. The company pays them. Yeah. Zambia is foreign currency, definitely. Well, yeah, they quacha, they end their quacha. Well, what's, what's your net worth? 
Wow, that's a difficult one. I believe I don't. How many cars do you have? I've got one. It's not possible. It is very possible. You have one car, mm -hmm. but a good one. Well, it's a Mazda three to three. <laughs> Mazda three to three mm -hmm. for a Traverse CEO yes. founder. Yes. Oh, awesome. Okay. It's not about cars. It's about what? It's about you being comfortable in your skin. Whether you're in a 3 to 3 or you're in a Mercedes Benz or in a Range Rover, mm -hmm. as long as you're comfortable, it can get you from point A to point B and you're actually happy with yourself. So if you're given a dead son, you still accept it? Yeah, as long as it can get me to point A to point B, yes, I'll drive it. Okay. So we want to decode your brain thread because what about getting from now is um you're a carefree person but very a bullion when you comes when it comes to your goals mm -hmm. how did that like how did your background contribute to this failure to fear to fail and not wanting to be overtaken by men is what has made this person that i am today in my world there's no men we are all equal in my world i don't know about your world if they are women. But in my world, there's nothing that a man can do that a woman cannot do. So where I come from, we are all equal. If you can fly an aircraft, a woman can do it. If you can build a house, a woman can still do the same thing. So there's nothing that's called, this is a woman's job or this is a man's job. You know, back in the days, our parents used to say a woman's place, a girl's place is in the kitchen. And most people unfortunately believe that and still believe it up to today. Which is why you find most of the girl children in the rural areas, when they get to grade 7, they are already married mm -hmm. to somebody. Sure. When they get to 12, 13 years, they are already marrying them to somebody. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in that. Each person must be given an equal opportunity like the boy child. Because as much as you might be a boy, I might be more intelligent than the boy as a sure. girl. We, today we've got so many doctors that are ladies. Mm -hmm. We've got so many aircraft engineers that are leaders. So there is nothing like a man's world or a woman's world. It's our world. That is my take. So is there any script to success? For example, does education contribute to success? Is there any script? You know, I, don't, I wouldn't say there's a formula to success. I also wouldn't say you have to have a PhD to, 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 to succeed in life. I wouldn't say that. I'm not saying that those that have PhDs mm -hmm. cannot succeed. Anyway, anyone, they will put different formulas to success. But where I come from, I don't have a degree. I also don't have A-levels. But I employ people with degrees. That's why they're there. Those that have degrees, they come to work for those that don't have degrees. But if you have the brains behind something, no one can take it away from you. I would, I would say maybe it's a gift from God. God gives us different talents. He gives us different gifts. It's up to us as human beings to work through those gifts that God will have given you. You might have a degree. I might not have a degree. But I might have a better job than someone who has a degree. Or even a better business than someone who has a degree. So it's just realizing your talent, realizing what you're good at, and follow it through. Okay. So right now, the point where you are, who is your inspiration? Who mentors you? Wow. I wouldn't. There's no one that I look up to. I look up to God. Oh. That's the person that I look up to. I could find a few people that I would call for advice here and there that if I have an issue. I always talk about Dr. Mangunja all the, all the time because he has contributed so much into my success, into my business. He's one person that saw me and identified me and said, Zodwa, you can do it. He's always held my hand whenever I'm falling. The, 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 he's now the governor. But I've known him way before he was a governor of Reserve Bank. And um, there were difficult times that we went through as a business and as a banker, he was there to encourage, to uplift. You know, some people will say, oh, okay, because you're doing good or you think you could do it better and then they'll look down on you and just let you be. But he was always there to say, okay, don't give up. You can do it. 
What's giving the push? He's always giving the push. Don't give up. Don't look for partners. Don't do this. You can do it on your own. Look for the bank. The bank can assist you. Things like that. Many people believe having partners is success. It's not success. Yes, it works for other people, but it doesn't work for everybody. You might have a, a partner. I'm, I'm not talking about partner as marriage partners. I'm mm -hmm. talking about partners as business, business. business partners. And also, if you are going to have a partner, you have to choose the right partners to partner with. Some partners come to destroy, some partners come to build. So you have to be clever enough to know what kind of partner do you want, what kind of a partner are you going to bed with, because you end up involving yourself with the wrong partners, and as a result you end up destroying your brand or destroying your business, because we might not share the same visions, we might not have the same goals. We might, someone might think, oh, travel agents have got so much money, they might see you with a million dollars in the bank account, and they think, oh, a million dollars already, Half a million is my money. Mm -hmm. Yet that money belongs to the airlines. It's not our money. But you have to be clever enough to know that, okay, this money that I have, it's like a lawyer. Being a travel agent is like a, a lawyer who is entrusted with funds for properties and things like that. Mm -hmm. Because when you buy a house, they don't convince in for properties. That money in the account is not their money. It belongs to the next person. Same applies with us, my kind of business that I do. When you see the money in the bank, it's not my money. It belongs to the airlines. So I'm a custodian of the money, and my responsibility is to make sure the money gets to its to its destination. But other people, you'll have a partner who says, "Milo, says, oh, okay, money." When they're not there, they take it away. I had a partner like that when, when I started the business, who saw money in the account and thought the money was our money and took all the money, and we actually closed. Yet the money belonged to the airline. So you need to to know what you are doing, who you are partnering with, what business you are doing, what is needed, and, you know, everything else. There's no formula to success. But you need to have good partners. Good partners, good brains, and good support needs. People that are committed, they love their job. You can't do it on your own. It's not possible. No one has ever built an empire by themselves. I can't do it by myself. The people that I work with that surround me are the ones that help the vision of the company go forward. They're the ones that make the company, like that make Travage be Travage today. I can't do it on my own. Fine, I'm the founder, but I cannot do it by myself. The people that I work with are the ones who help the growth of the business. Okay. So what's the most Lefietan or the biggest um, struggle or hurdle that you've experienced so far in your life? I think when Especially the, in business. When my, when the, I remember we used to bank with one bank one before, yeah, long back, and you know then those banks used to close. Just one minute you wake up, the reserve bank is closed. The bank, the bank is no longer. It's under curatorship, and you've got airlines money in there. We actually also just closed the business because the airlines money was in the bank, and the bank closed, and you couldn't get the money. That was the most difficult moment of our of our time at Travel Travel. And we actually, we actually did close doors. So you closed and reopened? We reopened with the help of Dr. Mangunja of CPZ then. Okay. What gave you this push to reopen? It's like something has because failed. They, my clients believed in what I was doing. Oh, wow. They believed in me. They knew I could do it. They, they, they experienced the type of service I was giving them. So closing was a disservice to my customers. So which is why CPZ was one of my customers then said, look, if you close down, there's a gap that you are filling that will be missing. So I had to reopen and they helped me. They gave me a loan, I reopened and would never look back. Wow. So what's the mission and vision of Travers and of Zodo Makanda, the two? Wow, well, Zodo is about to retire. So my, my mission, I've accomplished what I wanted to accomplish, I think. I think I'm giving myself another two years to work, then I retire. And um, our vision is to be the largest travel agents in the, in the world, no longer in, the, in Africa, in the world. We need to be a one-stop shop, online travel agents. We also, our mission is to make sure that we tailor make all the travel related needs of all our customers regardless of their pocket. To make sure when they come to us, even if you have a dollar, 
mm -hmm. make it work to wow. get you at least to a destination. Okay. So now we're moving to your social side. How many uh, children do you have? I've got two. Two children. How do you deal with controversy? There's no controversy. What controversy? Probably someone saying so, so this, this, that. You know what? What I've learned in life, people always talk. Yeah. You cannot be answerable to everyone. People have got different opinions. People don't have to love me. It's not everyone has to love me. As long as my God loves me, that's the most important thing first. If God loves me and you don't love me, you don't put food on my table. So to me, it really doesn't matter because those that matter to me are someone who's going to take away my breath. Someone who's going to say, okay, if you don't do this, I'll take away your breath. Then that one I fear, then that is God. But anyone else? No. No. I don't fear them. They can say whatever. I can't control mm -hmm. what social media writes. No. I can't control people's opinions about me. But I can control what I think about me and what I give out there to the public. What do you like to do on your spare time? I like to sleep on my bed, watch TV, go to church on Sundays, read the Bible a little, but I spend most of my time watching television. So... In conclusion, what do you have to say, probably to that girl child in um, probably Tangamvura, <laughs> where Dr. Lance <laughs> grew up? Okay, I will talk yeah. about the girl child in Bimbis, where I grew up. Bimbis. <laughs> they must not give up. Not having doesn't mean you will not have for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Like I always tell people, money is a visitor. It comes and goes. When you receive a visitor in your house, it's how you look after that visitor for them to stay or to come back or never to come back. So being at a certain situation today is not permanent. It might change tomorrow. And for the girl children, they must not look out for these blessers that think by, you know, men take advantage of girls because most of the girls don't have and because men have, they think that it is their right to abuse our children because they have. They think that it is their right to lure the girl child into say, oh, I'll buy you a pizza, I'll buy you champagne, I'll buy you a phone, I'll buy you this. And because these kids are coming from backgrounds where they don't have, they then think they are loved. And then they are used today. Tomorrow is a different guy, tomorrow is the other. They must just be strong. Be yourself, work hard. The sky is the limit. Just leave these blessers alone. Because there are so many of them, they will never change. They are all the same. They treat our girls the same, which I'm really, really against. They treat them all the same. But the girls don't realize that they are being used by these men. What the girls don't understand is, they might be, you might be 18 today, beautiful, yellow bone, mm -hmm. tall, slim and everything. You'll get to the age of 30, I'm 48. They'll get maybe, most of them might not even get to be, they might not even get to my age. Yeah. By the time you get to the age of 30, you've slept with more than, I always tell my girls, girls, if you start having sex early, by the time you get to the age of 25, 30, you've slept with more than 20, 30, 40 different men. And it's not right for a, for a lady. You are going to be somebody's wife tomorrow. And real men that come from proper families, will not want to marry kids that are all over. They want to marry children that are coming from stable environments, mm -hmm. that are coming from proper families that are well brought up. So there is no rush to sex, to girls. There is no rush. If a boy says you don't love me because you're not sleeping with me, there is no rush. You sleep with a girl today. There's one girl I met. She was 16 years of age. She had a boyfriend. She came back to me four years later. I told her, you're 16 years, you've got a boyfriend who is four years older than you. It's obvious he's going to ask you to sleep with him. Yeah. And she says, yes, I'm already having sex. And I said to her, do you realize that this boy is not the first boy that you're going to have? And if you're 16, maybe by the time you're 17, you'll have broken up. One, you don't know what sex is at 16 years of age. But you're already indulging. By the time you get to 20, you might have four or five, change four or five boys. And you are, all going to, you are going to sleep with all of them because that is what you are used to doing. But if you wait until a certain time that you are mature, I can't determine what time or what age that is, but if you wait until maybe 2021, 
and you really know what you're doing and you know what you want, then also you might also meet mature guys that will respect you, that will know what they want, they know how to treat you. But you can't expect a 20-year-old boy to know how to treat an eight, a 16-year-old girl yes, who is going to jump from one bed to the other. And there's really no rush. There's really no rush. That's my tip. No rush to sex. No rush. Why should you rush? Why? And especially you young boys of today, you want to wear in trousers that are free. <laughs> If my daughter brings one of those, they won't enter my gate. It doesn't happen. Wow. So it's really it's sad and tough because the kids of today, especially those that come from less privileged uh, families, you know, from poor backgrounds, they think by saying yes to these men, then the men will open doors for them. And they don't. They never do. So in, in conclusion, how can the government yourself and successful women contribute to the edification and uh, probably the entrepreneurship of the girl child? I think the girl child, what we need to do, especially mm -hmm. the government, the Minister of Education, maybe from a young age, mm -hmm. it's unfortunate now, long back, that we used to receive free education back then, in, before you guys were all born. We used to get free education. The, girl, the children used to go to school for free. If you didn't have money, your parents didn't have money, you could still get education. But now maybe what you have to do is the government has to identify, not just the government, because they can't do it on their own. We also have to come in and help them identify these kids that are must, so talented. There's a child that uh, I think some school in Gueru yeah. that I read an article who wrote seven subjects at A level. Mm -hmm. And had seven A's. That's including maths, physics, and whatever. And, and I think that's a girl. It's, it's, it's a girl. Um, I think it's a girl. The yeah. name sounded like I don't know if it's a girl or a boy. But I was told that when I was reading the article, they were saying this child used to stay up at school when others had gone home because at home they didn't have electricity. There was only electricity at school to to study. He will she will she will leave school at three a.m. and trek twenty kilometers home to go and bath so that they come back to school on time to start okay. lessons with everyone else. So talents like that, these are intelligent kids. We have to take them from that age and put them in the right places. If it's the universities, maybe even offer them bursaries at our universities, because if someone has excelled like that and we leave them there in the rural areas, what's the next thing? They're going to get married mm -hmm. at the age of 14, 15. That's what they're going to do. And that is talent wasted. That could be a future president. Of the sure, country, sure. this could be our future ministers. Mm -hmm. They could be. They they could contribute to the growth of our economy. So we need to work together. And those in different areas, I'm sure there are MPs everywhere in the country for different constituencies that can identify children like that that are talented. Maybe not even just girls only. Even young boys. Young boys are also being abused these days. It's not just about girls. They are also being abused. And also there are also some boys that are very intelligent as well that need us to assist them to move to the next level. So I think it must be a collective effort to make sure that we identify talent. We try by all means. I know it's not easy to tell somebody's child, don't do this, don't do that. Those that are brought up well, they know that a parent is a parent, mm -hmm. regardless. Sure. Where I come from, if someone older than me tells me, no, you don't do this, don't do that. Whether they're my mother or not my mother, I must listen because that's how we're brought. But children of today, they'll tell you you're not my mother. Why I say that? Yeah. So we should go back to the drawing board. Where are we going wrong? Where are we missing it? Children must be children. They must go back to being children. In the 80s, that was unheard of. That mm -hmm. a child, I would meet a child kissing a boy in the streets mm -hmm. and beat him. And that child would say, who are you? You're not my mother. You can't do that. You, you could not do that. They'll be so scared that if I, this message gets to my parents. Mm -hmm. That's how, that's what we must, we must fight to have back. So that when a child sees a mature person, they know this is my mother, this is my sister, this is my brother. They have respect for everyone. If we go back to the roots, then I think we'll be a better nation. Wow. Thank you so much, Zozo. Thank you for your time.